Well, I hope this uh, video is the right way up. I've had to change the, uh, the view from, from through the camera from one way up to the other, if you know what I mean. You just do uh, the setting in the camera, so hopefully that's correct. And hopefully these upside down jellyfish motherships are not going to spoil the view too much. Um, I was looking at the uh, a couple of videos put out by the Soul Foundation on the Soul Foundation YouTube channel. The SOL Foundation, the shit out of luck foundation, as the Americans say. Um, I thought that uh, the guy that was talking about the physics of UAPs, uh, he probably should have dawned on him, I think, that what he was talking about what weren't actually real objects. He was saying, oh yeah, well what goes from 80,000 feet altitude down to 50 feet altitude or 10 feet altitude in less than a second, you know, the amount of power you need to do that, the amount of braking force, the amount of energy you'd have to dissipate. And it didn't seem to have occurred to him that it, 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 it's, it's going to be a glitch on the radar system because nothing can physically do that. I mean, what would be the point of engineering a vehicle that could do that with all the associated engineering problems with it? You know, you've got, if you've got a crew in there, the G-forces would be incredible. You know, in science fiction, you can just write, write a line of text, you know, inertial damping. But in the real world, you can't do that. And I, uh, I thought it was quite interesting that Kevin Day, quite interesting that Kevin Day, the radar operator on the Princeton, He's the guy that's reported these things going from 80,000 feet down to you know, 10 feet in less than a second. This was, of course, immediately after the Princeton had had a top secret systems upgrade. So it was so secret that the uh, the uh, it was so secret that the, the crew weren't told. Um, but uh, Kevin Day, he, he's the he's the guy that reported this uh, this extraordinary performance, and he actually said in his own words, and I made a video to uh, to show this. He said, "Well, I think I know what was was really going on there." But he said, "I've got my own opinion as to what was going on there, but um, I'll keep it to myself because I don't want to spoil the credibility of the story." So, what does that tell you? That tells, tells me that Kevin Day thinks it was a system glitch. And uh, this guy also quoted the JAL encounter. Now, uh, the JAL captain had reported motherships buzzing his aircraft before. <laughs> the co-pilot on the flight that the guy was referencing didn't see anything of the sort. He only saw a bright light in the distance. The primary radar returns could have easily been just from ice crystals forming into clouds around the aircraft. It's above Alaska. Big aircraft 747 as it's going through the air, it's creating a lot of a lot of air disturbance, and it could have just punched up some ice particles that made it appear that there was something really there that was uh, following the plane. Uh, yeah, so. As, as usual, there's just a couple of stories here. There's no real evidence that uh, uh, there's any ET involvement. I mean, even if you had the radar tapes that showed primary radar giving a return near the JAL aircraft, it doesn't prove it was an alien spacecraft. It's far more likely to just be a cloud of ice crystals. So, uh, you know, I'd, I'd put, put a line through that. And uh, it was really disappointing, actually, that these uh, PhDs, PhD physicist, it didn't occur to him that it could be something as simple as a system glitch. But he's talking about how how fantastic all the uh, you know the amount of energy you would need and the amount of energy you would need to dissipate and all this, you know. But it didn't occur to him that what he was talking about wasn't a real physical object. It was just a glitch on a radar system. So, uh, so that, so that was the first thing. The other thing I thought was quite interesting was that I saw uh, Gary Nolan's presentation, and he was talking about uh, these different uh, materials. And um, he, he, I, he didn't say that he'd taken any control samples from the region. Now, whether he was handed this stuff told where it, where it came from, I, I would imagine that. I think he said he got it from Jacques Vallée. To be honest, 
personal opinion, I wouldn't really, uh, <clears throat> I wouldn't really, <laughs> I don't think John Vallee has got much in the way of credibility when it comes to this sort of thing. He's been a big fanboy for a long time. And uh, it just occurred to me, I mean, Gary Nolan said, well, this is, you know, it's silicon. It's almost pure silicon. It's been turned to glass or something. You know, what does that? And I thought, well, a lightning strike would probably do that for a start, you know. And if you had a lightning strike and it struck uh, a point on the ground where you had some rocks, a lot of rocks, well, especially in Australia, got iron in them, and it vaporized, vaporized the rock and vaporized some sand, you're going to get some... You could very well end up with the sort of thing that Gary Nolan was, uh, was talking about, examining with his electron microscope or whatever it was. So really I think what he should do is, what Gary Nolan should do, is um, get some control samples. See if you can get some samples of um, beach or ground that has been struck by lightning in the region where this uh, supposed alleged ET material came from. And he did make mention of the bismuth, bismuth magnesium uh, sample. He said he couldn't analyse it, it crumbled apart, but he couldn't do something about that. So he can, he can analyse it. Now what I think, I should have left him a comment actually saying, what he needs to do is to get a sample of industrial waste from a lead purification process called the Betterton Troll lead purification process because that the Betterton Kroll lead purification process generates waste it causes magnesium and bismuth to form in layers on the surface and that sounds to me exactly like what Gary Nolan has got there it, that, this, this sample that Hal Putoff has been peddling for decades and has already been analysed by Linda Moulton Howe found to be terrestrial industrial waste. So uh, yeah I think as I've said before you know the SOL foundation, the shit out of luck foundation, well they will be with regard to analysing any extraterrestrial materials because I don't think that's what they've been given. I mean if they're given something that's alleged to be ET, certainly no harm in analysing it. I'm all for that but uh, I really don't expect them to be finding any ET materials. I certainly wouldn't expect to find any samples from an extraterrestrial spacecraft containing iron. It's got a high iron content or iron through it. Because a, an interstellar spacecraft is going to have to have as little mass as possible. And aliens are going to be able to engineer all kinds of super exotic, low mass materials that, that we can't even imagine at the moment. So there's not going to be any iron in uh, an alien spacecraft. How many times have I said graphene is 200 times stronger than steel? It's super light. It conducts electricity like copper. It's an ideal aerospace material. But it's not metal. And I think aliens will have materials that would make graphene look like balsa wood. So, uh, yeah, well, I wish them luck, but I honestly don't think they're going to come across any ET materials. I don't think an ET spirit species would be stupid enough to leave any technological or biological samples here for us to study. I really don't think they're going to help us get to them and potentially destroy them. So, uh, anyway, that's my thoughts on uh, just my thoughts on a couple of Sol videos that I watched uh, yesterday. One was Gary Nolan, and the other one was uh, I can't remember his name, but he was. PhD physicist and I think he's sort of looking into it a little too deeply to be honest if you look at it if you don't look at it quite as deeply I, I think uh, I think it's pretty obvious that what he's what he's describing is you know system glitches primary radar reflections on ice crystals uh, you know it's not exotic spacecraft or exotic flying vehicles with all these uh, uh, performance envelopes that defy the laws of physics. It's just not going to be the case. Uh, so, well that's my opinion anyway for what it's worth. So uh, with that I'll, uh, I'll leave you to it. I'll say uh, as always thanks for watching and uh, maybe I'll catch you again.